So how do we deal with informational asymmetries? How do we deal with markets in which one party has more information than the other or which by nature the contract changes the behavior of one of the parties? Dealing with the uncertainty and the risk and the lack of adequate information can be very difficult but is a very normal thing. A few recent examples and even more recently in the Philippines. So this links with the material we've looked at before, namely probability and how to deal with uncertainty in assigning weights. So if you um, can assign probabilities to different events, to different states of the world, you can sort of assign values uh, that more or less guess at the possible benefits or costs of, of an event. So for instance, if the Lee family faces 50% chance of no medical expenses, 50% chance of 10 grand in medical expenses. You can simply take the probability weight, 50%, times that state, um, and you add up all the different probabilities so that they add up to, of course, 100% times each state. So 50% chance of um, zero medical cost and 50% chance of $10,000 of medical cost the expected value, the expected um, cost for the Lee family would be $5,000. And here's an application question to check to make sure that you have it. And to solve it, <clears throat> you would take the probability of each event. So the expected value is the probability times that state add them all up. And here we have two states of the world, $20,000 loss. You could actually call that a negative $20,000. And what's the chance of that? Um, looks like 20%. And then there's a an 80% chance of $0. So the math on the right side is pretty easy. The math on the left side here is 20% uh, of $20,000 is negative $4,000. And so your expected value is $4,000 loss. All right. Perhaps a more interesting question is, given Mark's information, what do we do with it? If he is like um, everyone else in his town, and there's a 20% possibility of accident, 80% chance of no accident, will everybody in town demand the same set of insurance? And the answer is it's not quite so simple. So simply assigning weights and probabilities won't get us to explain the market for insurance all the way. What do we mean? Well, we know that everybody's risk-averse, and we're um, most people are risk-averse, I should say, and we're willing to pay some uh, of our income to to assign risk to somebody else to sort of escape some of our risk, um, and this in has to do in part because we value dollars, and the more dollars we have, the less each additional dollar means to us. It's the idea that we've been developing over time that um, if you have a lot of something, each individual unit, one more unit, does not mean as much as if we had very few of them. So if you go backwards and you start losing income, you start losing money because of that accident, for instance, um, that's going to carry a greater weight than um, gaining income. But beyond that, we have differences in risk preference. Some people enjoy uh, driving fast and are willing to accept a higher risk for accidents. Um, and some of us have higher wealth and income than others, which can, of course, um, allow us to absorb a lot more um, monetary cost. So a risk-neutral person would be the person that is completely insensitive to risk, and those people don't really exist much in nature. And, of course, there are some uh, psychological, behavioral economics aspects of this as well. For instance, the market for gambling. If people are risk averse, how do you explain the popularity of gambling? Is there some other experiential benefit that we're ignoring of that lifestyle? 
Um, is it perhaps addictive? And so rationality is compromised. So moving on. There's enough risk aversion to know that there's a hefty market for insurance. So the idea that some people are willing to absorb other people's risk for money um, is what makes insurance markets work. So trading risk, of course, can produce mutual gains if there are people that are willing to absorb it and people that are willing to um, pay them to absorb it, then you've got a real market. So the risk goes from the insurance buyers, the people that want less risk, um, to the insurance sellers, the people willing to absorb the risk. And in part, uh, some of the motivation for the insurance sellers is they can uh, through diversification, for instance, actually um, take steps to minimize the risk. An example would be British merchant ships, diversifying through sending ships to different destinations so that if there were a storm in one route, it wouldn't destroy the entire fleet because they had multiple routes. This, of course, um, requires this ability to, to diversify requires that the storms at sea are independent events. They don't um, increase the likelihood. One storm does not increase the likelihood of other storms. At this point, I'd like to introduce the idea of asymmetric information. When one side has more information than the other side, when suppliers know more than buyers or vice versa, you've got a real problem on your hands. This leads to the problems of adverse selection and moral hazard. So adverse selection is the first of these problems. It occurs when one party knows more about the way things are than the other party. For instance, shopping for a used car, buyers know less about the quality of the car than the seller, and so buyers, because of that unknown, because of that risk of something being really wrong with it, are going to ask for insurance, in a sense, be, to price that risk. They're going to say, for instance, I'm going to pay less than I otherwise would for, that, for a new car, um, in part because... Uh, not just because it's older, but because I don't know exactly what's wrong with it. So um, buyers are going to bid down the price of the car because they're expecting poor quality or at least they, they know there's some risk in that car. And so what happens is this strange, vicious cycle where, whereby um, because buyers underprice these cars, bid down the price, the low prices themselves end up being a signal to sellers that they might as well not sell their good quality car because they're not going to get fair price for it. They're not going to get the, the true value of it. <clears throat> and they're going to keep their best items at home. So if I've got uh, a Honda Accord that's worth $14,000 and because of this adverse selection problem, buyers are only willing to pay you know, $8,000 for it because they're worried about some unseen risk, it ends up that even though some buyers might be willing to pay for a good quality $14,000 car, because they don't, they can't be sure they're not going to buy it, they're going to keep the price down at $8,000, and I'm going to keep my good quality car at home because it's just not worth it for me to sell my good quality car. So the, the best quality cars um, are often kept off the market in the used car market because of this problem, and it it ends up being almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's called the lemons problem. And as an application and extension from the probability work as well as adverse selection, you can answer this question. And the answer, $6,000 once you work the probability. So how do we solve some of these problems with lack of information? Because clearly this makes at least one party worse off, and, and if we could improve the information, that would be um, a gain. So screening and signaling 
are two of the solutions. Screening here is using observable information about people to make inferences about their private information. For instance, sorry gentlemen, women do get in fewer accidents, adults get in fewer accidents than teenagers, etc. And so the screening by age or by gender is a way to assess risk more than you otherwise would be able to. Screening potential employees by looking at their Facebook pages is another way. Another way of dealing with inadequate information <clears throat> is by signaling. So you can signal, uh, especially to buyers, what your quality is. A warranty would signal good quality. Heavy spending on advertising signals good quality because only a firm that knows how to make profit can afford to heavily advertise. Educational degrees are often thought of as signaling, carrying not so much information about how much you know um, as what kind of person you are, that you are a quick learner, can persevere, etc. Reputation is another way for firms to sort of signal their quality. And the other big problem in private information or asymmetric information is the problem of moral hazard. This is seen most frequently in insurance when one party knows more about their actions than the other, especially if you are insured against theft, against um, loss of valuables, you might not lock your door as much as you would otherwise. Or if you're insured against Kidnapping and extortion, there really is an insurance market for kidnapping and extortion. You might wander around in unsafe neighborhoods or you might travel to unsafe countries a little more than you otherwise would. Well, insurance companies are figuring this out and so one of the solutions in health insurance as well as all these other types of insurance is deductible. Make the party with more information have some skin in the game. So if I'm insured against theft, I may be more likely to leave my door unlocked, but if I have to pay $500 deductible up front before insurance kicks in, then I'm, I'm going to be a little more likely to lock my door. The key idea is that insurance should never go all the way up to 100%. That's when you see the real moral hazard kick in. And that concludes our time together. See you in class. And the reason that matters is that sometimes insurers do not pay attention to the fact that what looks like diversification is not truly diversification because their independent events are not so independent. For instance, AIG's credit default swaps, it turns out, if the entire U.S. housing market lost value simultaneously, which had not happened yet, um, the whole thing goes down. So to diversify in mortgages in Alabama versus California works if the increased default risk in California doesn't affect Alabama, but as it turns out, it did. <laughs>